Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the lands and the territories that we're on right now. We're on unceded territories of the Mohawk and Genekiaga peoples who um, these lands are traditional for. And they've been a meeting place for many groups of people and continue to be so for people like the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, the Mohawk, and settlers as well. So I just want to start by saying that. Thank you. Can I also say when I was doing my litany of thanks, um, that I forgot to thank Michael Venus and Never Apart and your fabulous staff who were so good about making this work. So thank you so much. Tom, do you want to thank anybody while we're on? <laughs> uh, I second all of the thank yous that Jordan offered earlier mm -hmm. to the folk, wonderful folks at McGill and Concordia and uh, Never Apart and, of course, Bradford for putting together this uh, amazing program. Uh, and DJ for um, your presence. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I, I, I uh, let me let me start. I I had not seen this program in advance. I saw amphetamine, I think, in the '70s, and I haven't seen any of the other stuff. And so it's, I'm I'm processing just as madly as all of you are processing. Uh, and um, what a program, Bradford. Um, it's very bi-coastal, isn't it? It sure is. Well, we're bi. <laughs> I mean, dirty look. Is it, I think it's on, but it's soft. Yeah, it's working. I've never been soft before. No, that's it, that's it. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you can talk in Miss America words all you want, but um, this is actually a you know, pretty thorough representation of um, all the people that we've worked with consistently um, and love on both coasts. And we've been working on two coasts for, um, well, we started regular programming in Los Angeles in 2015 and started Dirty Looks in 2011. Um, but, you know, that never really stopped us from touring and things like that. So, like, I mean, we were showing that Mariah Garnett film um, the, the year that it was made all around the country, really. Um, and and sort of same with the Chris Vargas, which you know he's also moved around quite a bit. He started in Oakland, um, and then went to that's Liberace. Liberace on, um, which is like you know I I think one of the things too about this program is like there's a couple pieces in here that I can watch like Liberace on, and then a piece tomorrow, the Vaginal Davis Bruce LaBruce piece. It's like sometimes when you tour with something as a programmer, you're like, oh, it's that one. It's time to go outside. But it's not those. And it's just like I will watch Liberace on until the day I die because that movie is just so incredible to me in that it's able to hit all of these notes. And it's totally hilarious and totally serious and political, but camp. Um, and... Yeah, and also like, you know, gloriously SD, you know? Chris was like, I love um, when I tech check with Chris and when I tech check with Dynasty Handbag, I'm like, how does this look? And they're like, it looks like shit. That's how I made it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it is. And um, I think that's just a nature of, of, of moving back and forth um, and and also people moving back and forth. I mean, Michael Robinson used to live upstate um, in New York. He's the guy who did Lossless Onward Follows. Lossless Onward Follows. Onward Lossless Follows. Um, and now he... Um, the only film without sex in it, right? Well, there was, there was longing glances. Oh, there was, that's right. And there was like grinder, appy moment color things. Abduction. Moments of tech-based ecstasy. Or peril. Or isn't it one and the same? Who can tell? Um, yeah, I, I honestly, the amount of textural difference between all of the films was so delightful. I found that um, moving back, before, back and forth between... 16 millimeter and then to like video and to um, different kinds of saturations. Even in Liberace on that like cheesy like end of the 70s TV filter mm. um, was just, it was, 
it's very enchanting. I found it I found it to be really exciting. But the whole program I found to be so delightfully excessive in like all of the textures and the like even the 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 encounters I may have had with Peter Berlin, like there's so many floral kind of like too much everything in the in the scene, which I I just adore. Do you think that's what drove our many of our spectators away? <laughs> Uh, the excess, I mean, has experimental over the last 50 years retained its capacity to drive people out of the theater? <laughs> well, I think one thing that's important is like, um, you know, now it's supposed to be cool, uh, like art's cool. So it's like you're supposed to like go to the experimental film thing. And historically, like that was, you know, it wasn't the popular thing to do. And I think that one thing that I try to do within the idiom of dirty looks is create events that are largely historically based, but also engage with contemporary um, cultures. Um, but I mean, at the very beginning, what I was doing is I was literally making I just cleaned out my storage unit, so they are haunting me. Um, I used to make a postcard, a like lovely designed postcard for every event, so it kind of looked like a party, um, and it was something that people could put on their fridge, or it 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 um, it had this kind of you know ulterior aesthetic life, um, and I think it was sort of like a bait and switch, not really a bait and switch, but like I tried to. Um, imbue my excitement towards the material so that others would sort of like get high off of it too and, and go to the events and, and engage in something that, you know, let's be real, an experimental film screening is not exactly the friendliest of contexts, um, you know, be it, uh, you know, wandering into a per particular film program at Anthology or, you know, a film festival. It's very insider, kind of clicky space, but I do think that um, it doesn't mean that this isn't um, a platform for that, that caters to or speaks for um, queer communities. And I think a lot of those films, um, some of those films are welcome in the kind of like insider experimental spaces, but not as queer films. And like that Michael Robinson film to me is his most like emotional that I've seen him, him make. He largely makes some really formal um, found footage work. And when I saw that, I was like, oh wow, you're really going for the gay here, Michael. Um, and I was really happy for that. But it's also, you know, he'll get into projections, but then like a queer festival will be like, well, he's got projections, he doesn't need us. And I just think that kind of thinking is sort of silly to me. So you're in for an expansive space. I'm open to all experiences. <laughs> oh my. I mean, that's that that seems to be sort of a, a theme running through all of these different films as well is that they're not just one kind of one kind of gay or one kind of queer film. Um, and even like a conversation that we were having before the screening, it came out that not all of us on the stage are queer scholars or queer intellectuals or however it was phrased, because there is a difference between, um, gay films and queer films and intellectual work and all of these pigeonholing labels that we can get into and get distracted by. But I think it's really interesting the different kinds of um, eras to which these films speak because we were jumping around in time quite a bit. I mean, I love Liberation's various... Well, we're not jumping around that much. We have a film from the 60s and one from the early 90s. And then the rest is like within the last couple of years. But I think what DJ is speaking to is also the reference points. We're talking about Liberace, we're talking about Dynasty, we're talking about Peter Berlin, we're talking about... Okay. Uh, but the argument is one of exclusive mass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, but there, there is a, a premise about, with, with, a, with queer programming, about a community and a constituency, right? And in your description of the program, you use the second, uh, sorry, first person plural pronoun we. Mm -hmm. And you see a thread among the eight works, DJ. Uh, I think that it takes a lot of digging to find this kind of coherence in the program. And that's what you 
say is the beauty of an experimental program. It's all over the place and totally eclectic and, and uh, different textures and different sounds and different images and different eroticisms and different sub constituencies, right? Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm at a loss to, I don't think the program, sorry, uh, I don't <laughs> think the program, I think I was being facetious when I talked about bi-coastal. I don't think the program feels as if it's coming out of geographies and spaces, um, nor formal uh, uh, premises uh, or starting points. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the program, I guess, thinking aloud. Um, well, there is the capacity to which the program is like a historical mix, a mixtape, if you will, of Dirty Looks um, trajectory. But I think also outside of that, um, there is a very willful desire that it be completely medially disparate. You've got high eight, super eight, um, 16, HD, SD, all packed into one program, and that was really intentional. Um, but then also, I think for me, I mean, um, thinking about the talk the other day, you know, this idea of queering as an appropriative gesture, and there's a lot of um, uh, instances of play, either with genre or imagery or icons within this program that's sort of um, very much a heart at heart in, in terms of the way that I appreciate queerness as a sort of political or subversive strategy in the world, be it Chris Vargas or Mariah playing their um, iconographic figures. Or, you know, even I think probably the most charged of that is um, Brontez saying, I want to make a Warhol movie where I play Edie Sedgwick. You know, I mean, that's loaded as hell. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of room inside those appropriative strategies to, like, play with what, you know, also to the question of, like, what is queer in 2018? It's such a minefield. Um, so this, I think, is, is, is in some ways a means to look back as a means by which to look forward um, through history in one program, you know, you can't do it all, but I think I, I I tried to do a lot with this one. Did I do too much, Tom Waugh? Yes, you did too much, and that's what's <laughs> wonderful about the program. <laughs> um, I, I still haven't recovered from the first film, the, the 1966 film. That was the year I started college, and we all looked like that. <laughs> uh, uh, with, you know, button-down shirts and uh, uh, very, very tame haircuts, right? And so this, this, this film about shooting up amphetamines as uh, subversion and revolt, uh, but at the same time, romantic, benign coupledom and respectability in this, in this apartment is so fascinating uh, uh, to see, isn't it? I mean, this was the, uh, uh, this was the 60s. And filmmaking. I think one of the things that I love about that film is, you know, Warren Sonbert would go on to make a lot of really formal films that are about seeing and experience. But this is like a kid making a student film where he's like, I want to show what it looks like using this thing and film I want to make a movie that looks like I'm high. And it's super crude, but like that to me is really fascinating because they've got you oscillate between like the shooting up and then just this blurry images and early abstraction that's that's intended to codify drug use or or, or per drug perception. Um with all of those other things, with the Supremes, with the aesthetic, with the fact that it's like capturing a counterculture that really is not captured on film. I mean, for me, when I first saw this movie, I was like, oh, 
I mean, just amazed because it, what it does in a really short amount of time, I mean, you know, there is the provocative stuff, um, but also that was there, you know? Um, I don't know, that I just jumped in with the vision part because I think that's that's an important part of it because it's, you know, these are all films that don't necessarily represent, they're not documentaries per se, but they they represent something that is part of life that perhaps isn't glimpsed or is revisionist or not seen. So like um, projection and fantasy and, and, and different modes of seeing are intended to be represented in here um, in a lot of very disparate ways. They're for not sure. documentaries, but many of them have a documentary quality that looking backwards uh, is so fascinating. I mean, the Cunnilingus lineup, for example, uh, that was that was that was wonderful as a kind of document, yeah. um, in many ways. Uh, so it's sort of documentary at war with experimental in many of these films, isn't it? Absolutely. I think there's a silence where I'm going to talk now. It's um, because I said the word kind of lingus, isn't it? Um, maybe, maybe not. I was. It was very interesting when I was watching that film Frenzy. I was thinking back to. Um, all the work that's been done recently on Riot Girl and um, the sort of the opening of the Fails Library Special Collection, the with the Riot Girl collection and all of that stuff, and and yes, and <laughs> and watching it, I where looked is at that? The Fails Library is is an NYU library, and you have to have a special ID card made to get in. It's uh, very priv, but they also have the downtown collection. You have to you get have a, to you just have to get ID made, whatever. You have to announce yourself. But um having that located there and with that kind of punk rock aesthetic and as well as that kind of like rock star aesthetic, like having a line of groupies go down on you. It's very like even while you're like teasing your hair or just whatever, you watch them fight it out. I thought that the um, the excessive like hedonism of that was pretty fantastic especially watching that in like a riot girl set up in like 1993 with all of the wanton skirt chasers of nyc riot girl um i thought that was pretty fantastic just because of so there's so much material within the program itself that while it's very hard to uh navigate the minefield of queerness these days which is huge this it's um it's really interesting because even talking about Brontes's work and like how fiercely homosexual he is, yep. as opposed to queer, as opposed to a queer person of color, that's that's something which we kind of have to address now. And like coming at it from the perspective of being like a trans non-binary art historian, that kind of makes me bite my tongue a little bit and think a little bit harder about what it means to be queer and what it means to be within these programs now. Well, also. Um not to call out, but that film was also censored in its original version, and what you saw today was an uncensored version um, because um, censored by whom? Censored by its by the commissioners um, because the language of that film was deemed too triggering for audiences. Um, who who were the commissioners? Can you be vi sure? visual aids? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and I um, I don't condone that at all. Um, and I think that there were things that Brontes, you know, that Brontes video is so provocative. Um, but that's, you know, what Brontes when he does when he's being provocative, it's not a means to an end. It's it's a it's a way of opening up, you know, a lot of different conversations about around you know his identity by and large. I mean, this is a person who's incredibly prolific. Uh, I, I don't know if everyone in the audience knows Brontes Purnell, but he's a musician, he's a dancer, he's a filmmaker, he's a writer. I mean, it's like kind of crazy. He'll like you know come over to my house and be like you know blacked out, and then the next day I'll be on Facebook and he wrote a children's book, and I'm like, how do you do all of this? But um, he's uh, but. I guess maybe quite like this program. There's an excessiveness in um, the way that he performs and 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 performs self that I think grants a kind of permission in 2018 um, to think outside of these boxes that we're all 
being written into. I mean, one of the things that got um, cut out was him calling himself or saying that he had prison body. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm black and queer, but what kind of black and queer do I have to perform in this world? And that was very intentional, I think, for him. Um, and so I'm, you know, I think initially when I made this program, it was going to be the mixtape, the one that used 100 Boyfriends, uh, the mixtape, which is a different version, um, which is like more of a porn version. Um, and then I just was like, okay, no, we're doing the demo, just so that people see what he intended for the world to see. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, considering that the program from last year's um, last year's visual aid uh, day without art program was was so intentionally based on like experiences of like black filmmakers yeah. working around HIV, and it's such a good program. I saw one of the panels at the Schomburg Center, and there was a really interesting discussion between um, a lot of the filmmakers, including Cheryl Dunier, about this work that keeps coming back to HIV AIDS over and over again, and some of the uh, some of the remor the remorse and like the disbelief that we're still having the same conversations, you know, so long afterwards. But I thought it was, I thought Liberation really addressed that quite a bit. You know, it's um, taking back all these deathbed proclamations going on forever and ever, and ending in the ACT UP um, chant, slogan, motto, <laughs> mantra. Well, humor can be a really, humor can be a really, uh, effective channel to pathos. And I think that's what both of these films do. I mean, I love when Brantez goes, <laughs> turns out I still have HIV. I mean, I think that's hilarious because it's sort of like, you know, watching an audience watch that line too. It's like, there's like this shock and then it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, and that's good for God's sake. I mean, and that's sort of what, um, what what Chris does with his deathbed proclamation too. It's like, it's hilarious, but it's also, you're watching someone, uh, Liberace, in as big of air quotes as ever have been, um, die of HIV AIDS related complications. You know, um, I don't know. I just love a sense of humor sometimes. Tom, what do you think about that? I'm I was thinking there's much less humor in the selection of eight films than I expected. I mean, those two you've just mentioned are the the two masterpieces of camp or humor or or irony, aren't they? But th the rest was p pretty sober, wasn't it? Um, is it Tung Jiao? <laughs> Tung Jiao is in a category by itself. <laughs> Amy Gogan is in a category all by herself. It's true. She was, uh, she's the one from the 90s, right? No, 2013. Mm. She was in Denver. Uh huh. It was very pink, wasn't it? <laughs> it was highly high pink. Eight. Okay. High yeah. eight saturation. Okay. Uh huh. It was a video of my high school film classes. You guys were the same age. Um, I have to bring that up, of course, because like it's really interesting because I remember. Um, the switch over at my high school from this analog inline editing machine to Adobe and like the first computer we had in the back corner mm -hmm. and how that's it's brought up again and again in this program and I'm going to come back to this textural thing being the art historian that I am but the difference in um, eras and the difference in filmmaking and the difference in reference points. It is all over. And although Tom is right, and we have a certain film from 1966, we have Amphetamine from then, and we have a film from the 90s, and we have a lot of re more recent films. It's referencing all of these points in gay and queer culture as it has been. And it seems like what unites them for me, although Tom says it's a, it's a reach, Tom's saying it's a reach, but... Um, it seems to be these cultural points throughout gay and queer culture that we can pull something from, at least. Shouldn't you be speaking in the plural, gay and queer cultures? Yeah. I mean, how can you how can you really talk about having seen this program about Ooh. queer culture? Well, I if that's if 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 you're saying what I think you're saying, I love failure. So maybe this program just fails. 
In which case, what a great thing. There's Farron. There's Farron with a question. Oh God. Yeah, if you don't mind, we're doing this for the recording, even though I didn't. Hi, Bradford. I decidedly did not feel that your screening was a big failure. Um, I um, I think the the idea of a thread running through these films is really interesting because when, as it was unfolding in the beginning, I was thinking about the role of music within these within all of the selections and even um, like even though Brontes' movie didn't really have a soundtrack, anyone who knows Brontes knows that he's speaks and lives with more musicality than <laughs> anyone else has in their pinky. But as we like got closer towards the end, like I started to think of like the spatialities of queer affect and like alienation and isolation and how well that fits within an experimental film program. It's like work that makes people faint and walk out and like have, you know, like visceral reactions to things. And I was also thinking of how that alienation exists in relation to historiography and like how we're supposed to like look back at AIDS, at ACT UP demonstrations and learn a lesson from the past or how we're supposed to like, the project of history making is supposed to be one of not necessarily linearity, but one of a cause and effect situation. And so when you can't, when you trouble that with like contemporary views of isolation of Brontes, like just really sad and depressed in his bathtub, um, or the idea that you get the that you get the vision of ACT UP through a dis distancing effect of Liberace watching it on his television. Um, I think a lot of this is like I think it's, it's a program about failure, but it's not your failure of a theme. It's about maybe the failure of a queer project. Um, I think it's reaching for all of these like different affects and those affects don't necessarily have to thread together. And so I think the fact that I was reaching for threads and those threads kept changing as to what was moving me about things, um, I think was thoroughly successful. Um, I guess my question would be, when you are looking for those more historical reaches back into history to try to juxtapose these sort of contemporary visions of queerness, what is your sort of process for finding what older films are going to mesh with contemporary films, which are more easily sort of programmed through looking at other festivals. Like, I know that I programmed a couple of those films that were in this through looking at other festivals. And there's more of a natural sort of journey through contemporary programming, even experimental. But how do you find those like older films to plug in there? Well, the, um, the, I mean, to speak to specifics in this programming, um, the I wanted to put the Brontes movie by um, amphetamine because I just thought it was like they were they're cut from the same cloth but completely different. Um, and I mean, this particular program is like again a kind of history of dirty looks, not necessarily within the specific titles, but with the people um, that are making the work. Like I've never shown that Michael Robinson film before, but I've shown him a million times. Um, I think like the instance of frenzy. Um, I was talking about it a little bit earlier today. Um, I did a screening for Mix actually, um, where we were. They asked us to do um, 
the 25 year anniversary screening of a retrospective of, of things that they've done. And we did a two part program where we picked a title every year from the festival, not from the year that the festival happened, but that was programmed in that year. And um, there was a, a, a Umatic tape at sales and it wasn't playing in the thing, but we could get it transferred. And I'd read about Frenzy and sight unseen, I was like, this goes in the program. <laughs> and and someone was like, no, 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 you should do this one. This was better that year. And I was like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. Like, this is what we're going to do. Like, I just, I, I know, you know. Um, and we did the screening, and um, people flipped out when they saw this film. Uh, that was in 2013, um, I think. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I think Jill's actually since gone in and 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 um, had everything retransferred. And I, not to be like a media fetishist, but um, there was a um, it was a really cruddy copy. And I don't know. I kind of miss the cruddy copy because it it the wear and tear kind of was became a part of it. Um, but you want to footnote: media fetishism in the room. Okay, I know, I know. Um, but uh, uh, I think it's the, the things that cut to the heart of what I'm trying to say within a particular program, but also I think within the context of Dirty Looks, I'm always trying to find really important, works that I feel are really important to a particular topic that are not in circulation or are not part of the like kind of canon. Um, you know, it's e even going back to the first ever Dirty Looks, um, was not um, Kenneth Anger, it was Curtis Harrington. I tr I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a contrarian. And I like to think back, you know, Curtis Harrington was a filmmaker um, who started making work in the 40s and operated the camera on fireworks. So it's like, it, it's like the urtext of the American avant-garde film history. Um, but, you know, he's not as well known because he ended up making commercial films. Um, so you know, it's 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 a real admix of things, but I think um, it, it is this when I'm watching something, and if it really just sort of like strikes me um, in a way that both translates to the contemporary content, but also um, you know needs to be back in the world. I'm a very um, I work very urgently, I guess, or something. That's sort of our mandate also at Queer Media, sort of queering the canon, challenging the canon, keeping the archive alive. Yeah. We had a little debate about uh, hosting you, Bradford, because our mandate is uh, the archive that came out of here, out of north of the 49th parallel, uh, because it's excluded from most of the canon. You're showing two Toronto works tomorrow night, so you are saved. <laughs> but saved by the Judy Jones. Right. Uh, but we thought, okay, this will be in, in the spirit of uh, uh, Trump's new U.S. Mexico Canada free trade agreement. We decided to to host you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and uh, so it's sort of interesting seeing this work in that light. Uh, as a kind of sort of guest national cinema kind of thing going on, uh, sort of a reflection of the spaces you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the concept of media fetishism, I just wanted to explain because I accused Bradford before the screening of uh, around his obsession with with uh, analog uh, celluloid uh, uh, projection and the original format of the two works that were in. 16 millimeter, and the burden this imposes on community spaces that want to show, uh, want to host him and uh, show show the work. Uh, poor Jordan has been running around for three months, <laughs> setting up this 16 millimeter projection, uh, importing. You're being recorded. Importing, <laughs> importing across the customs line, <laughs> the 16 millimeter prints from San Francisco. And so I'm just wondering, uh, in the context of the internet and online qu queer canon, 
how do you how do you justif justify this kind of uh, purity around the, the medium? You know, it's really funny because I am so not a media purist at all. There's all, there's something I think of a little bit of lost in translation that occurred in this particular instance. But again, we couldn't have done this digitally um, because amphetamine isn't digitized. Um, but I I feel like when we spoke. When are we sending it back? Hold there on, hold on, hold on. We are not, <laughs> we're, I'm not, I'm not going to participate in a false dialectic about the business of bringing the material. No, 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 I, no, no, no. I know I understand that, but I think I'm trying to reach more generously into Tom's question, and it is that where we talk in, when we, you know, we talk about bringing things out of the archive, we usually just mean showing work that isn't shown often enough, uh -huh. you know? But I think that in physically, you know, bringing the reels, for that we also have um, Alana Thames uh, lab at McGill to thank for being able to have the projector here today. I mean, I think that sometimes it is a call that we make um, uh, for pleasure. And I'm going to say that there is a, that there was, for me, an actual uh, semi-erotic uh, frisson from just the beauty. Why do we pass the wax no, no. I, but I'm not saying we're, I don't think we're disagreeing. I'm just, I just want to, wanted to rescue the impression that this was at all more work than screening some digital work. A community, a community venue would not be able to do this. <sighs> I mean, to be, that's, I find that unfair because it, what I, what I do with Dirty Looks, I bought a projector in 2011 on eBay. It's been the same pageant. The bulb blew out three years later. I never screened a single print with, uh, uh, sorry, internet, with, with a splicer. I had the same projectionist. And we showed in bookstores and dance clubs and rooftops. Sorry, anthology. Um, that's not fair because you can do it and it is our job to do it because if those works are film works and like I've seen a HD digital projection of that Mariah Garnett work. Well, Mariah Garnett is commenting upon uh, Peter Berlin and the way that Peter Berlin made his image and the period in which he made his image and that flickered to life in a much more effective way than if the, H the HD projection had come on this screen today. And that's, that's understanding the media specificity of it, but also the theatre of presenting media in a space with people. Because that thing clicked on, those guys shot up, you guys felt really authentic because there was a projector whirring in the back. And that's a lot of different things. Um, it's theater, but it's also the intended, the intention of that original work and media to be presented in that way. And it conveys a lot of specific things in 2018. So um, I, appreciate the fact that we were able to do this and do it in this way. I mean, we're literally going to do this exact thing at the stud in San Francisco in two weeks. And I'm driving up with my pageant and Canyon is going to send a projectionist and we're going to just do it. Why you are know? why are you why, Tom? Why are you gagging so? Um, <laughs> Bradford brings it to us every ball and in my in my, in, in my uh, observation, showing the, um, I mean, the anachronistic use of 16 millimeter, and I'm, I'm totally like photobombing the panel right now, but the anachronistic use of 16 millimeter, I do find kind of weird in the Peter Berlin, a 2012 film, I'm like, oh, I'm getting all Vancouver on me. But in the first one, <laughs> in the first one, we actually saved $1,000 by not getting it digitized, which is how I see it, and in a world, um, in a world where we can depend on these collaborations uh, that, uh, you know, that allow us to show this work, uh, if the choice was um, to 
digitize that film and not afford to be able to bring you here <laughs> um, or to bring it and bring you with it to talk about it, the choice was uh, very real and obvious to me. But I know that underlying that is the Marxism for which I love you very much, <laughs> which is that um, there will be an affordability to the digital that is something, but it requires showing that film maybe a couple more times, like Farron was saying, where do people find out what is worth uh, investing in digitizing? And I think it's from some of these programs. Never Apart has another event tonight at Ausgang on Plaza Saint Hubert. We have officially reached the point where if there is to be a last word, typically I would offer it to someone who has not yet spoken or someone who would like to ask the final question on whatever level of affect it may be. No pressure. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to say, um, I think, Farron, you have a point around a perception of there's maybe some queer failure indicated, but I also feel like um, with a particular trajectory in, in this program, uh, the final film really um, throws that for me because I feel like there's uh, this this cross generational um, connecting. There's this embrace. There's just you know it. F I feel like there's an end on some kind of a let's say note of triumph. Even though Bradford, you say you're not um, wanting to promote nostalgia in the work that you're showing, and I actually would be interested in you maybe making a little point about how you distinguish this idea of nostalgia versus like showing historical pieces. Um, but yeah, I'd, I feel like there's success, not failure. The cross-gender thing is yeah. also... Oh, did you say gener gen generation she or gender? She's they said um, cross-generational, but I'm saying let's also remember cross-gender yeah. because that's a very important part of that work as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's so funny that I'm on this stage talking about um, being a media purist because I really don't, I'm not, you know, I, uh, well, there's a long story there, but um, I think um, I think I respond very strongly to certain types of cinephilia and certain types of um, male-dominated film cultures that are active. I don't know uh, how active they are in Canada, but they're very strongly active in New York and Los Angeles. That's about fetishism in this way that I find really banal and actually kind of, I mean, I won't go so far as to say violent, but like um, there are places that used to be um, the refuge of, you know, the cinephile just to go and like engage with a movie and now they've become very like, um, uh, uh, like clucking when you recognize something and everything has to be on film, even if the film, you can't even see it because it's so magenta. It's like, at least it was on 35. And I think that is bullshit. If there's a superior experience to have of the object, then you go, like if, 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 if the, the film looks terrible, then don't show the film. The content is what's important. And I think um, the, the idea of nostalgia um, sometimes people are like, oh, well, you just like to go watch the, you know, find those old movies and, and show them. And it's like, well, no, I mean, it's, I think I don't really see the, um, I don't go out, out and look for the, the film itself as, as, as a film form, but I'm looking into the moving image object that I, that I'm studying at that particular time for the content. And if the content still speaks today in a resounding way to me, then it doesn't matter what it is, if it's high eight, if it's HD, whatever. Um, I just found um, from the New York Public Library this like incredible um, 1974 documentary 
about a black trans woman living in Ohio that there's no record of on the internet. And I'm like flipping out. That's like the next thing I wanna delve into. And it's on 16, we'll probably show it digitally. Um, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's so much, there's so much to um, the potency of that representation, that th that object existing in the world in 2018, um, there's such a paucity of documents of life at that time that that is not nostalgia to me. That is political. And I think nostalgia is when that gets paraded out um, to be self-congratulatory, um, which is, I think, a lot of cinephilia a lot of cinephilia today, to me, is about bolstering somebody's knowledge base, and I have no interest in that at all. Um, if I can be shocked by something and thrilled and scared or whatever, like, I'll remember that. The other stuff is sort of like, yeah, that friend of the Wicker Man looked good. What's next, you know? <laughs> in my humble opinion. Do you want to say something about nostalgia, or? Uh, no, we we just got cut off. <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody.